incredibly humbled to have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker today, Ms. Tawana Petty. I still kind of can't believe that, that she's here. Really early on in our planning for day to days, we knew that we wanted our keynote to keep the day grounded in what matters, and that's people. Everyone in this room believes that data can be a force for social justice. That's why you're here. It's why it's day to days and not just a tech conference. But we also know it can do as much harm as it does good. We wanted our keynote speaker this year to help give this community a playbook for using data in ways that further social justice and center, oh, oh no, hello, and center people in the conversation. Tawana Petty has written that playbook. In our planning committee circles, she's best known for her role organizing data for black lives. Personally, I'm in awe of her work with the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, and especially the guidelines for equitable open data in Detroit. And I got to kind of pick a few parts of that guideline, that guidebook today. So that document includes prioritizing the release of new data sets based on community interest, publishing data about all city services, even for privatized public services, and engaging residents offline about open data, among others. You should check it out if you get a chance. She is a mother, a poet, an author, and a facilitator. She is a longtime social justice organizer whose work focuses on racial justice, equity issues, data privacy, and consent as you could see from the title of her presentation today. Ms. Petty has used her talents and gifts for community building to dispel the criminalizing narrative of her city, Detroit, which has convinced many of the need for mass surveillance technologies as mechanisms for public safety. She has received many accolades for her work, and I'm just gonna pull a few of them. In 2018, she received the Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition. In 2021, she was named one of uh, 100 brilliant women in AI ethics. In 2023, she was named the AI policy leader in civil society. And most recently, she is a Just Tech Fellow with the Social Science Research Council. Without further ado, we get to hear today from Ms. Tawana Petty. Thank you. Good morning. I think about what time of day it is. So bear with me, I'm on day eight without using my cane. Can y'all give me a round of applause? <laughs> ah, I shattered my ankle almost two years ago, so it's full of metal. Um, and this, yeah, so it's an interesting dynamic. So this, this podium is gonna be a little bit of a crutch. I'm a poet who likes to work the stage. I'm not sure how much that's gonna happen today. So thank you for having me, Day to Day's Cleveland. In, yes. In Detroit, we say, what up, though? You know, y'all can say it. Y'all can borrow it. So as you can see from my title, data are not neutral. Privacy matters. Coercion is not consent and surveillance ain't safety. And I use ain't, because it's now in the Oxford Dictionary, but I've been using it for a long time, before, you know, when I used to get in trouble for it in English class. But surveillance ain't safety. I'm just gonna get right into it. And this is my first time using a HP computer in like a decade, so bear with me. <laughs> I did it. Okay, so first of all, congrats. I heard a rumor today, because I wasn't here this morning, that you all have an executive order on Open Data Portal. That's a big deal. Listen, I had a whole slide yesterday that I deleted, because I was like, why the hell doesn't Cleveland have an Open Data Portal? But anyway, so I deleted the slide and put it back when I got here and found out that y'all have one. 
an, at least an executive order. So uh, congratulations on that long fought struggle. So I'll just briefly touch on that. Uh, some of the guidelines that we did with the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition and Detroit Community Technology Project in 2015, uh, we put that out when Detroit uh, created an open data portal. Uh, and so these guidelines can be found uh, at DetroitDJC.org along with our zine. Um, and so I'll just talk to you a little bit about it. I, I'm not gonna read through all of the guidelines, you can see them there. But I will say community engagement is going to be paramount and not faux community engagement, right? Community engagement, like an example of what we do in Detroit with the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition are called data discotheques. And discotheque is short for discovering technology. So there are community fairs that we do in collaboration with city officials, community organizations, and residents to kind of demystify data, right? What does it mean? What does it mean to have this portal that has data that you can access? And so we ha actually have a zine that you can download for free on how to organize those in your community as you try to engage around open data and bring the community voice authentically into the discussion around open data. All right, I won't preach about that much longer. <laughs> so, Yes, you have something to hide too. How many of y'all, when, when we're talking about surveillance technologies or data and privacy, goes, well, if you don't have anything to hide or I don't have anything to hide, how many of you, by show of hands, I'll close my eyes if you don't wanna embarrass yourself, uh, sorry, but how many of you have thought that or said that, in all honesty? Oh, those hands are raised so low. I see, <laughs> you're like, but you do have something to hide and privacy actually does matter. So I'm gonna walk you through a quick little exercise to prove my point. And if I don't prove my point, just pretend I did. <laughs> so what's in your wallet? If you have something in your wallet or your pocket or your purse or whatever that you have to give your birth date and age, I want you to pull it out And while you're doing that, if you had to give your eye color, keep it out or pull something else out. If, if you had to give your height, can y'all hear me? Because Mike keeps doing a thing. If you had to share your income or household income to acquire said card or ID or whatever piece of material or paperwork that you have in your wallet, Pull that out. Your home address, if you had to share your home address, pull that out. Information about relatives or neighbors or friends, i.e. references. You had to share like some proof that there are people who know and like you. <laughs> Employment info, you had to share where you work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Your sex or gender, you have to share that info to get access to this resource that you have in your pocket. Credit score, they ask you like, do you pay your bills? And, and if you pay them, do you pay them on time? Members of your household, like how old are they? Do they also make money? Can we call on them if you default? Marital status, are you single? You have a spouse? Did you have to share that? Educational level, if you had to share your educational level. Okay, so all the cards and things you pulled out, I want you to pass them up to me. <laughs> oh wait, you don't want to? You don't wanna give me your credit cards and your gym membership and your library card? and your driver's license or your state ID, social security card, you don't wanna give that to me, why? Wait, wait, why? Oh, cause what, privacy matters, right? You have something to hide, to protect. I'll just move on from that, did I prove my point? 
So let's talk about biases, right? Um, I love this framework. How many of you are familiar with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, AKA NIST? So they defined what biases are, right? And they did it so succinctly because when we think about data and technology, a lot of times we think of like technical biases, but we don't think about how biases show up discriminatory ways like human cognitive biases. And so they define them within their framework in, a, in what I feel is a very succinct way, right? And they're talking about artificial intelligence, but how many of you know artificial intelligence is made up of data? All right, so systemic can be present in AI data sets, the organizational norms, practices, and processes across the AI life cycle and the broader society that uses AI systems. So systemic bias. Computational and statistical biases can be present in AI data sets and algorithmic processes and often stem from systematic errors due to non-representative samples. So you didn't collect enough of this particular demographic, so now your data set is only going to represent one demographic, and so some biases can be introduced in that way. But how many think about the human cognitive biases? Biases that relate to how an individual or group perceives AI system information to make a decision or fill in missing information. So you don't have all the data you need and now you're gonna make your own educated guess around what data to include, but it's going to come from your purview, how you see the world, how you experience the world. And they also go on to say, human cognitive biases are omnipresent, they're everywhere, in decision-making processes across the AI life cycle and system use, including design, implementation, operation, and maintenance. So every time you touch the data, you're introducing your human cognitive biases, whether or not you mean to or not. And so they exist in many forms and can become ingrained in the automated systems that help make decisions about our lives. And so I'll just read this this sentence, in case you're feeling all guilt-ridden out there in the audience, it says, while bias is not always a negative phenomenon, AI systems can potentially increase the speed and scale of biases and perpetuate and amplify harms to individuals, groups, communities, organizations, and society. So it's not always negative. How you view the world is not always negative, but it's good to be keen on the fact that you're going to introduce that whether you're thinking about what data to collect, how you process the data, how you disseminate the data, what you do with the data, and who you share the data with. You introduce that because you're a human, and it just happens. So, moving on to talk about narratives, right? How do dominant narratives and human cognitive biases impact the types of data we collect, but also policies that are implemented based on those human cognitive biases, right? I grew up in Detroit. Detroit has been, my entire life has been a predominantly black city. At one point, it was 90 plus percent, it's now somewhere around 80, right? So my entire life, Detroit has been under what I consider a dominant pervasive negative narrative until recent years. And I'm just gonna walk you through a little bit of evidence about that, is that okay? So, I was born in 1976, so I'm 47 years old, and so for a half century, my entire life, uh, many would argue and research has shown that this basically started at the election of Mayor Coleman Young around that time, the first black mayor of the city of Detroit. So I was born in 1976. For my entire life, I grew up learning a particular thing about Detroit. Like this is a place you gotta grow up and get out. Like you can't make any viable contributions if you're a lifelong Detroiter and you have to go somewhere else and become something. This is what you're taught from a very early age about the city that you grew up born and raised in. And it has a psychological impact. So I've spent a lot of my time re-spiriting, particularly young people, to feel good about where they come from. 
And so 1977, there's a film called A Fistful of Yen. And in this film, there's this like overlord who's punishing all the people he considers to be his enemy. And in his punishment, he has one, he, he has all these ways that he punishes people, but his worst punishment that he inflicted was to take people to Detroit. So he literally said, when he got through the line, like he's doing like, he's, you know, excuse me, but he's doing like these violent ways of punishment, right? And he gets to this man who's his like worst enemy ever, and he goes, take him to Detroit. And the man is like kicking, screaming, being dragged out, anything but Detroit. So it's, it's meant to be a joke, and you know, it makes sense to laugh at it, but over time, those sorts of narratives have an impact, not, on, not only on the way you see yourself as a Detroiter, but the way policy is implemented, the way visitors see Detroit, the way people who never come to Detroit, probably because of that narrative, um, how they see Detroit and so on. So this is 1977. So in 2007, Cade Benfield wrote an article, right? And it said, is it time to change the narrative about Detroit? And what Cade said was, you know, basically people want to invest in Detroit now. So in order to get people to invest in Detroit, we got to stop talking about it, you know, so horribly because who wants to come here? So we got to kind of flip the script. And so what Cade said was the standard narrative for Detroit has been about a bankrupt, vacant, decaying, post-industrial wasteland, an environmental, social and economic disaster. Detroit has been the quintessential shrinking city, the poster child for everything that has gone wrong with the post-industrial Midwest. And that's how, that's how Kate summed up what this dominant pervasive narrative about Detroit has been. And I'm, a, I'm gonna call y'all out a little bit, Cleveland. I love y'all, but, <laughs> uh-huh. 2009, very famous viral tourist vi tourism video from Cleveland. And I, I lift up this example because I know Cleveland can relate to being dragged through the mud as a, you know, all these negative images about Cleveland, right? But how did you all get yourselves out of that? You crapped on Detroit. <laughs> you crapped on Detroit. 2009, I still love y'all. Y'all a sister city, I get it. Backs were against the wall. <laughs> so 2013, tough, cheap, and real again. This is National Geographic. They're basically saying like, hey, they did a bankruptcy thing. People want to invest in them now. Detroit's cool again. You all should like consider going there now. 2013. 2014, drop dead, Detroit. So this is an article that Paige Williams done, uh, did, and she was talking about the late L. Brooks Patterson. How many of you know who L. Brooks Patterson is? Okay, so he was an Oakland County executive who had a lot of political power over Detroit, controlled what transit could come in and out of Detroit, controlled a lot of housing resources. He was very powerful. Although he was a leader of a suburban community, he wielded a lot of power. And so he did an interview with Paige Williams, and I'll read to you a bit about what he said. And he reigned for decades, many decades. Anytime I talk about Detroit, it will not be positive, therefore, I'm called a Detroit basher. The truth hurts, you know. I used to say to my kids, first of all, there's no reason for you to go to Detroit. We've got restaurants out here. They don't even have movie theaters in Detroit. Not one, which wasn't true, by the way. He went on to say, I can't imagine finding something in Detroit that we don't have in spades here, except for live sports. We don't have baseball, football, for that, fine get in and get out. And when he was asked how Detroit might fix its financial problems, he said, I made a prediction a long time ago and it's come to pass. What we're gonna do is turn Detroit into an Indian reservation where we herd all the Indians into the city, build a fence around it, and then throw in the blankets and corn. And this is an executive 
who wield, wielded financial power, political power, a lot of power for literally almost a half century over Detroit. And so narratives aren't just stories we tell, right? When they're in the hands of the powerful, it has an implication on what types of data we think about, how we think about people as data, what policies are implemented, what resources are invested or disinvested in a community, and it has a psychological, emotional, and literal impact on the residents who live there. So now that I've taken you through that flowery, nice, pleasant part of my presentation, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about systemic and structural racism. And what that is, is that's inequalities rooted in a system-wide operation of society. And by that, I'm gonna show you a bit of data. I'm gonna show you some maps. So these first two maps are, uh, one is a tax foreclosure map, and the second one is a water shutoff map. So the tax foreclosure map was done by Loveland Technologies, and they did a mapping of all of the tax foreclosures that happened in Detroit from the period of 2002 to 2017. So I want you to look at all the red blotches. I don't know if you can really tell the colors on there, but the red, the dark uh, map, those are all red spaces, and every red space on that map is an indication of where tax foreclosures happen over that period of time. And just a little bit of information, well after this map was done, they came to the conclusion that over $600 million was uh, mistaxed over those residents. So all those folks who lost their homes, et cetera, they learned that they were not supposed to be taxed the way that they were taxed. And then they went on a journey to try to find some of those folks who have been displaced. So that's just to give you an example. And then the purple map, which is over towards this way, I don't know if y'all can see this way, um, that is a water shutoff map that we the people of Detroit Research Collective did. It's in a book called Mapping the Water Crisis. And it shows you everywhere where there is water there's either no water, water's been turned off, or water is, you know, scarce, where it's turned off frequently and turned back on. So these are two maps I wanna show you. Uh, I'm gonna move on to talk about spatial racism and digital redlining. This map was done by Alex Hill, Detroitography, and this map, the pinkish areas are areas where there are low broadband or no broadband digital connections in Detroit. So you're looking at everywhere where it's pinkish, light pink, dark pink, is where there's low to no broadband connections in Detroit. So let's talk a little bit about panopticons, right? So I talked to you about that foreclosure, tax foreclosure map, I talked to you about the water shutoff map. I showed you the digital redlining map. And then I'm going to talk to you about smart cities. So how many of you uh, are familiar with smart cities? How many of you feel like that experiment was successful? Yeah, kind of. I think I have one kind of. So this article from Digit Magazine talked about how the smart city can be compared to a panopticon. And so what I'm showing you is an example of a panopticon, which is a sort of prison that where the middle, where you see the middle where the prison guard is, where the, the people who are incarcerated cannot see who's watching them. They know their watch, they, they know that it's omnipresent, the surveillance is omnipresent, but they can't see where the surveillance is coming from. And so smart cities have kind of taken on that as a solution for what, what should have been addressing quality of life issues and quality of life crime, but instead of infusing resources, a lot of surveillance was implemented across cities as a mechanism for smart city design. And I'll give you an example. In Detroit, this is what's called the Project Greenlight map. So Project Greenlight are these, they're these flashing green lights that stay on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if one of, they're connected to businesses, laundromats, 
grocery stores, low-income housing, schools, recreation centers, restaurants, et cetera. Uh, and if you happen to live by one of these, your bedrooms by one of these, you're not gonna get pretty much any rest because they never turn off. Not only that, they're co connected to real-time crime centers uh, and police surveillance 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They leverage facial recognition technology along with Project Greenlight, and officers also have access to these cameras from their mobile devices. So if they want to kick their feet up at home, uh, sitting on the couch and watch these cameras, they can. So let's connect the dots. Water shutoffs, all the highlighted purple. Digital broadband redlining, all the highlighted pink. Tax foreclosures, all the highlighted red. And surveillance. Do you see any correlation? These maps? So, is it safe to say that green light as a smart city mechanism probably isn't addressing tax foreclosures? water shutoffs, or broadband in access in the community. So what's the impact of indiscriminate data collection, right? Project Greenlight is indiscriminate data collection. Every single person who enters into a grocery store or a laundromat or a restaurant or any establishment that has these surveillance cameras is in a perpetual lineup, essentially. So hoping to not be misidentified. I know you all may have heard Detroit boasts 50% of the known misidentification cases in the United States, leveraging facial recognition technology by police departments. But let me humanize that. Robert Williams doesn't live in Detroit. He lives in a suburb. But because every single person who has taken a state ID or a driver's license since 1998 has had their ID sent by the Secretary of State into this facial rec recognition SNAP database, his ID was in there. And so when some watches were stolen from Shinola, they went out to the suburbs and arrested him in front of his small children. And this was for watches. Um, Michael Oliver, he was arrested for st uh, stealing a cell phone, for knocking a cell phone out of a teacher's hand and breaking a cell phone. They used facial recognition technology, misidentified him, and picked him up and, 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 locked, and put him in jail. Portia Woodroff, eight months pregnant, they arrested her for carjacking two weeks prior. So they show up to her door, they say, hey, you're under arrest for carjacking. She's like, what? When? Two weeks ago. So did they tell you that the person who was arrested was eight months pregnant? Well, no, but the technology said that it's you, and we trust the technology. Lamia Robinson was 14 years old, she went skating. She gets dropped off by her parents like so many do. They say they're taking her temperature for COVID and then they tell her that she's been flagged as a young lady who had a fight some months earlier uh, and they put her out, it's like nine, 10 o'clock at night. They put her out the skating rink and tell her that she was uh, the young person who was fighting in the skating rink. So she didn't know that her face was being scanned for facial recognition. She was just having her temperature checked, 14 years old. So I want you, and she was misidentified to be clear. So these are just examples, humanizing examples of what happens when there's indiscriminate data collection, whether biometric or otherwise, um, and racial equity is not at the center. Another example I wanna show you is how many of you are familiar with the uh, traffic, surveillance traffic cameras that a lot of places are implementing? So this is from a Bridge Detroit reporter, Malachi Barrett, and he did some research to discover how Detroit had been using their surveillance traffic cameras. And in his research, over a 90-day period, they ran 25 million license plates over a 90-day period. And out of that 25 million, they had 64 arrests. So every single person 
who drove through Michigan, through Detroit, from Michigan or wherever, had your license plate. So think about that. It's a literal, perpetual lineup. So there are no innocent people. There are only people who have to prove their innocence when you let this indiscriminate data collection be the rule of the day, especially when there isn't racial equity at the center. So what happens when we think like that, right? When, when our human cognitive biases are not aligned with principle, when racial equity is not centered, when we're not thinking and pausing about should this data be collected, what happens? We end up with communities that are suffering under loop, looping cycles of injustice. And so surveillance, over-policing, disinvestment, poverty, broken families, water shutoffs, gentrification, closed schools, and devastation. So what do we do? We want to center racial equity, right? Of course we do. Don't know I'll jump up about that one. <laughs> so what is racial equity? This is a definition that we collectively created with the actionable intelligence for social policy. Some city government leaders came together, community members, nonprofits, et cetera, and we came up with a definition around how we wanted to apply racial equity to data collection. And so racial equity is the condition where one's racial identity no longer influences how one fares in society. This includes the creation of racially just policies, practices, attitudes, and cultural messages, and the elimination of structures that reinforce differential experiences and outcomes by race. And so how does that apply to data, right? You have to center data through every phase of the data life cycle. In the planning, when you sit down and you say, we should collect all this data. You have to be thinking about racial equity. Racial equity makes you think, should we collect all this data? Who told us to collect all this data? Where, have we engaged with the community around collecting all this data? Has the data already been collected? So I'll share some more questions with you later. But through the planning, when you collect the data, you have to be revisiting that definition of what racial equity is. When you access existing data, you have to be thinking about racial equity. When you use, especially when you use algorithms and statistical tools, you have to be thinking about racial equity. When you analyze the results of that data, you have to be thinking about racial equity. And when you report on what you found, Check the human cognitive biases. Is it reinforcing biases that you already think? If so, you might have to revisit this entire loop of your data practice. So I'll just read this little excerpt from our toolkit. And it says, at this moment in our history, we can co-create data infrastructure to promote racial equity and the public good or we can invest in data infrastructure that disregards the historical, social, and political context, reinforcing racial inequity that continues to harm communities. Building data infrastructure without a racial equity lens and understanding of historical context will exacerbate existing inequalities along the lines of race, gender, class, and ability. Let's think about railroads, right? We cover this in the toolkit as well. Yes, we want transit, but if you take a railroad and run it through a community, you might not be doing a service to everyone, right? If you run a highway, we know examples of that, right? You run a highway through a community. A lot of investment and collection might say, there are people who need transit, but there are also people who need to live and need to experience the community that they're living in. So, there, so you have to be thinking about racial equity at every phase of the data life cycle. So I've talked to you, I'm, I know this is such a positive talk. Go to happy hour, they have beverages. <laughs> uh, so now let's talk a little bit about trade-offs versus consent. What's a trade-off? 
Think about it. Biometric data in exchange for your access to your IRS account. Who wants to share their face just to access your IRS account? I personally didn't. Um, and so y'all should really join the dump.idme campaign, but whatever. Um, biometric data in exchange for accessing your IRS account. Biometric data in exchange for unemployment and other benefits. Having to scan your face for access to benefits. Biometric data collection in exchange for travel. These are trade-offs. They're not inherent. These are things that we've just kind of accepted. What's consent? Consent is having an option on whether you share your biometric data to open your cell phone, right? So it's different than you have to scan your face if you want this resource. It's like, you know what, do I want to use my face to open my phone? It's a choice. Having an option on whether you share your biometric data to open your banking app. You have a choice. You can use a PIN. You can use two-factor auth. Having an option on whether a website tracks you or uses cookies. Options. Having an option on whether you share your, share your location data. You can turn it off. These are options. And my personal favorite that's not on this slide, giving your palm print at Whole Foods for groceries. Come on. Seriously, let's just think about it. You, earlier we did an exercise, what's in your wallet? What's going to be left if we just voluntarily give up all our biometrics for access to every single resource that exists? That trade-off is huge. I'm not telling people what to do. I'm just saying consider it. Consider it. Because when you get hacked, yes, you can change your pen and you can do all these things. You can't change your face. You can't change your palm print. And there isn't a lot of federal regulation currently to protect us, to hold anyone accountable when those things happen. So what are some principles to consider when we're trying to do this like racial equity, data justice type frame when we're collecting data? Detroit digital justice principles, uh, access, who's accessing the data? Participation, who's participating in the practice? Common ownership, who owns the data? And healthy communities, is it contributing to healthy communities? And those principles are more spelled out on the website, DetroitDJC.org slash principles, if you want to read more about those principles and how to apply them. I want to lift up the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, so the Office of Science and Technology Policy a year ago, a year ago last week, launched a blueprint for AI Bill of Rights. And it really, it boils down to like these five principles, right? Safe and effective systems. You should be protected from unsafe or ineffective systems. Sounds fair, right? Algorithmic discrimination protections. You should not face discrimination by algorithms, and systems should be used and designed in an equitable way. Data privacy. You should be protected from abusive data practices via built-in protections, and you should have agency over how data is used, how data about you is used. Notice an explanation. You should know that an automated system is being used and understand how and why it contributes to outcomes that impact you. And finally, my favorite, human alternatives, consideration, and fallback. You should be able to opt out where appropriate and have access to a person who can quickly consider and remedy problems you encounter. How many of y'all are tired of saying, no, option one, no, option two, no, hello, speak to a person. <laughs> and they're like, I'm sorry. That's not an option. We don't recognize that. You should have that option. You should always have that option. So where do we need to center racial equity? Everywhere. Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> so some things to think about as you move forward in accessing, collecting data, right? What problem are you hoping to solve? Who determined it was a problem? Was the community you hope to serve involved in your planning or collection process? Is the data you are collecting necessary? 
Has it been collected in the past? Have we even addressed the data that was already collected? Does your data collection process provide revocability? Do I have a right to be forgotten? Are you gonna keep it forever? Are you retaining it longer than necessary? What are the social, my favorite, what are the social implications of the data you are collecting? I talk to data scientists and people who work in machine learning every day, and most times they're like, I, I used to uh, serve on the ethics committee at, for NeurIPS, and I used to say, you know, what's the societal impact of your, the paper that you're writing, the research you want to do, the technology you want to innovate? Oh, there's no societal Im impact. How is that possible? If you're creating anything, there's an impact. And so what's the societal implications? Who has access to your data? Once you collect it, who's going to have access to it? And are you centering racial equity throughout your data collection process? So what happens when you do all that stuff? You move from the looping cycle of injustice to a path towards justice, right? Research has shown that well-lit streets reduce crime. Did folks know that? Well-lit streets. Uh, shout out to Detroit. We have a, a team called Detroit Safety Team that's been trying to think of alternative visions for policing and how to reduce conflict. Uh, community investment, instead of disinvestment, we're thinking about how we invest in community. What are those quality of life issues that can be addressed, right? That can reduce quality of life crime. Equity, we think about equity instead of letting poverty uh, increase. Uh, we think about livable wages. Stop arguing about people in fast food making enough money to pay their bills. Don't you want your neighbor to be able to afford their house? These are important things. That's how communities and neighborhoods are viable and sustainable. Affordable water. Nobody's water should be turned off. And assistance is not affordability. Assistance is not affordability. Affordability means you pay what you can afford. Thriving, uh, affordable housing, same thing. Uh, a lot of AMIs for communities that say it's affordable housing consider surrounding suburbs. Detroit is another example. If the median household income in Detroit is $30,000 a year, affordable housing that requires a $60,000 a year income is not affordable for most Detroiters or Cleveland or any city for that matter. Viable schools, the schools need, we, we need to stop letting schools close. Period. Education is important. Not to be confused with schooling, but that's a whole nother lecture. And thriving communities. We move from devastation to thriving communities. So I just want to shout out before I end a little bit of visionary resistance in Detroit because it's not just all woe is me. Folks have really been, and I'm, I'm not going to name everybody who's doing visionary uh, resistance to these harms, but I do want to lift some up. Uh, special shout out to my comrades that are in the audience from We the People of Michigan. Woo woo! Okay. They're not in my slide, but shout out to them. Um, so, tools for uh, co -liber Oh, I'm sorry. See, I'm on this uh, PC. Visionary resistance. So some examples, I forgot I took all the slides out because I didn't know how much time I was gonna have. But visionary resistance, some examples are, we have a campaign called Green Chairs Not Green Lights, where responding to Project Green Light Mass Surveillance Program, where community members are returning to the front porches or their, their yards, their backyards, and the young people are building these green benches out of like rehab materials and holding community discussions. They're trying to m push back on that conflation between surveillance and safety and ensure that we know what it means to feel safe, to be in community, to see each other instead of watching each other. Right, and so we also have examples of community initiatives like Riverwise Magazine, which is a community of magazine creators that came out of the James and Grace Lee Box Center, where I know you all have Signal Cleveland that's doing similar work. We're trying to have an alternative vision to mainstream media so that you, the stories of community members can be told. And then shout out to Cleveland Documenters. We have a Detroit Documenters. It's like my favorite, it's like one of my favorite programs because Listen, who can go to all those city government meetings? 
No, no, it's not humanly possible. And so to have a community member in those meetings digesting and demystifying policy so that everyday people know what's going on in their city is very important. And so those are examples of visionary resistance. And so finally, I wanna leave you with some tools for collective liberation. Collective liberation, right? Really briefly, how much time do I have? Ooh, I'm not leaving much time. Okay, so anyway, let me just move on to the tools because I wanna talk to y'all. Digital Defense Playbook, you can find this at odbproject.org. You can download it. It has the What's in Your Wallet exercise uh, and a lot of other exercises and talks about the deconflating surveillance and security with safety and has a lot of other opportunities. Uh, this is a, de a defense playbook that I co-designed with our data bodies. Uh, also, there is a Consentful Tech curriculum. You can find Consentful Tech Project online uh, and and I co-authored this with Yuna Lee uh, from protecting ourselves to taking care of each other, uh, how to think about technology consentfully. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, the center, uh, the toolkit for centering racial equity throughout data integration. That, that is also free and available to download online. Uh, and I'll send these links so that they can be circulated to registrants. Uh, NIST, the, their Artificial Intelligence Risk Management Framework, you can get a lot from this tool, this uh, framework that they put out. Uh, data for Black Lives, which I used to serve as the National Organizing Director. Uh, data Capitalism, this is another site that you can visit that has a lot of resources. Um, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, A Study of Urban Revolution. This is a book that I recommend everyone read if you haven't read it already. Uh, Alex Hill's book, Before Redlining and Beyond, How Data-Driven Neighborhood Classification Masks Spatial Racism. Mapping the Water Crisis. This is the We the People of Detroit uh, Research Collective. Simone Brown, Dark Matters on the Surveillance of Blackness. I talked to you all about the uh, Project Greenlight. Uh, Simone talks about the 18th century lantern laws where in New York, if you weren't in the presence of a white person, you had to carry a lit candle lantern in front of your face. And so I liken Project Greenlight similarly to that type of program because it's shouting that this is a neighborhood to be wary of, but we want to gentrify this neighborhood, so we want you all to know that this is a place you can now visit because we're watching those people. So I want you to be thinking historically about these technologies. Uh, Ruha Benjamin has two books, Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. So she's uh, applying Jim Crow laws to Jim Code, which is technological innovation and how it has continued that trajectory. And her other book is Viral Justice, How We Grow the World We Want. It's kind of a map on how we move forward, you all. Finally, uh, I'm getting there, I think it's like three more. Automating inequality, uh, I served with uh, our data bodies with Virginia Eubanks. She wrote the book, How High Tech Tools Profile Police and Punish the Poor. And uh, shout out to a People's Atlas of Detroit. This will give you some Detroit, true Detroit stories that counter those dominant negative narratives I talked about. And a special shout out to this person named Tawana who wrote the book Towards Humanity, Shifting the Culture of Anti-Racism Organizing, a little bitty toolkit, but it'll help you walk through from solidarity to allyship to, um, to uh, co-conspirators and then finally to co-liberation, collective liberation. Thank you. All right, now while I remove my data from this laptop that is not mine, um, <laughs> I'm open for questions or comments, emotional outbursts, whatever you wanna do at this point. Yes, I'm going to send them to the organizers. I think everybody who registered gets emails, right? Okay, so you'll get all those links. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cleveland's going to have an open data portal as Yeah, well. congrats. My question is how, do, how often and how do you work with the folks in uh, open data in Detroit yeah. to ensure that there is an equity lens and there is not a risk of discrimination um, and, and you know, inequity in the data? 
Yeah, so you all heard the question? Okay, good. So yeah, so it's an ongoing, never ending struggle. I will say that there was a gap at some point in having a person at the city working actively on the portal to have that community engagement, but they have a new person, and she actually participates in our data disco text, uh, getting information from community members about how they want to see the data portal shaped. And so that has started back up as of this year. Um, and so she brings a lot of resources. She uh, answers questions from community. And one of the things we push, a, push on is like, uh, when you go to public safety, you don't just want like, criminalizing things you want what is what where would i go for shelter where would it, you know so it's about raising the consciousness of city workers as well as community members on like what are some other ways we could think about safety as an example but yes that's an ongoing uh effort yeah First, oh, I would probably, well, no, that's dense, a little dense. Yours. Uh, <laughs> yes, mine, you read mine and then you work your way up the list, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's helpful because if you're thinking about uh, how you move from so solidarity, real, like solidarity is like, oh, I'm with you. You're right, that's so harmful. Allyship, don't yell at me, but allyship is like, uh, I, I understand what happened is so terrible, and I'm, I'm gonna tell everybody that I agree with you. It doesn't go very far, right? Co-conspirator is like, where we, where we going? Who, who, whose statue we need to tear down? But co-liberation is recognizing that your humanity is dehumanized if my, my humanity is dehumanized, and that there is no way to create a new society if someone is benefiting profusely from an inequitable society and others are being marginalized. So that book does walk you through like what those differences are. Um, and it's not to say that if someone's sitting in solidarity that they're wrong, it's just, it's a journey. Um, and we enter it at different points. And so I would say that'll help you and then you move into thinking about how that applies to data, right? And how we think about data, et cetera. So not to be, I'm talking to everybody, not just like, <laughs> but um, it helps you move your, the thinking beyond that. Go ahead. That group. <laughs> Please talk to them. Uh, we the people of Michigan, yeah, they run a whole collection, a collaborative around ShotSpotter and the implications of ShotSpotter. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Thank y'all so much. I'm on social media at, uh, I'm on Twitter at Poet T. Petty. P-E-T-T-Y, and I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I do not have a Facebook. I, I have freedom from Facebook for, <laughs> I, well, technically I have Facebook because I have an Instagram, but we're not gonna get into that. <laughs> but that's under my artwork, uh, Petty Propolis. But uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter.